Good morning, eh. Good morning, everyone. Is this for you? Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me here. Uh, thanks to Center 42 and SPA. Um, I, I'm covering these few points. Actually, it's basically how uh, a data company uh, came to see the importance of the role of the dramaturg. Uh, it's because when we started in 1987, we, we were committed to doing uh, local original works. Uh, and we've been doing that uh, since then till today. Uh, and uh, when we started, we were addressing the multicultural uh, reality in Singapore. Uh, and uh, and most of our actors that came uh, into rehearsals, you know, we will be inquiring into uh, cultural practices and sensibilities and worldviews. Uh, we didn't have data studies then, uh, but we had. Uh, uh, I, I took I majored in literature and sociology, and Harish, the playwright, uh, majored in English language and literature. Then later he specialized in social linguistics, and those were the things that actually went into our data making. So uh, in the journey, I just will cover uh, TNS's uh, dramaturgical mechanism before the dramaturg appears, uh, yeah, appear, and then the dramaturg as cultural mediator, and then in interdisciplinary practice, and then later collective dramaturgy. Uh, yeah, so that's Harish, the resident playwright, and myself, and we've been working together for the for like 29 years yeah and so we develop a kind of collaborative and devising methodology and basically this is the uh, we, we've done it in three phases because uh, when you do new work and developmental work uh, Singapore's too small so you, you know you can't uh, in other countries you open at you know like uh, you, you have a reading and then you open at regional theaters and it has the opportunity to tour and the work matures. Whereas in Singapore, you can't open in you know Jurong and then open in Chai Chi. Or whatever. It doesn't. Once it's all conflated, right? So once you open, it, it, it opens, yeah. So, but you still need the rigor of uh, of uh, you know um, uh, developing a world. Mm. So we develop this phase one, phase two, phase three. Also because uh, we usually have a preview, right, before we open. And the preview when we first started was one week before we open. And the production people will make noise, the actors will get upset when you change lines and things like that. So it's very inhumane to do that. And <laughs> we felt, uh, but we still felt we needed to make changes, right? When you discover a, a lot of things one week before you open. So you can't make radical changes, you make cosmetic changes and we weren't happy with that. So what we did was to have to create this thing called phase one, phase two, phase three with two or three months in between the phases. And that kind of helped because the, the, the ideas percolate. There's time that you can afford to get lost. And you do other works and you find answers in other projects as well, which we slow, gradually formalize it into uh, an approach or a methodology. So the first phase is all like fieldwork interviews. It is mostly democratic. Playwright has direct Direct, directing ideas, directors has playwright ideas, playwriting ideas, and actors also can can suggest anything. Then phase two is dramaturgical, uh, in the sense that we invite normally forty to sixty people to come and watch, and give feedback. So we have to make distinction between personal responses as well as uh, structural responses. You know, uh, so so and constructive responses and then we'll see what are the things we'll take in because a theatre piece is never complete unless you have the audience and we need we we feel that we need that very much to get feedback so like for example when we did a play on fundamentally happy it's on pedophilia in the muslim family so we invited muslim friends to come uh, to watch and get feedback from them we also invited the censors to come so that they can see the community response to the work uh, and uh, gauge from there whether the work is because we need to apply for license uh, in that sense so yeah then after a few months pass uh, would pass uh, uh, phase two is when Harish would have written the play and we would stage it sometimes without the script sometimes with the script and uh, this also came about because uh, once we were processing a work and it was problematic and we had to bring it for a press conference for arts festival and uh, uh, it's a five minute piece and we just made a decision and it went on and when it went on I realized what was prob what was the problem with the piece 
So there is a kind of a idea of a temporary <coughs> product, you know, uh, in order to uh, a temporary product that contributes to the process of data making. So phase two is all about that, this temporary product that you can dismantle after that and recompose. And then, a f and then you have the advantage of a few more months, and then phase three is like three to six weeks where you compose towards the opening night. Uh, yeah, so that's the least democratic, and it goes back to the traditional uh, uh, hierarchical way of theatre making. So the first one I'd like to talk about is uh, mobile, and it's uh, cultural mediation was needed because uh, it's about mobility of Asians in Asia, and uh, it involves four countries, and that time I was still uh, naive and romantic, and I wanted four playwrights <laughs> from each country, yeah. And so it was a headache for Harish, and he was the master playwright in the sense that he had to make the final decision to tighten the work and to deal with the egos, right? So that, uh, and then he had to sit down to talk to each of them to uh, develop the subtitles as well. But we learned a lot. It was, uh, it was quite a steep uh, learning curve. And then we had two directors, one from uh, Japan and myself, uh, and we had two actors from each country. Right. So we had a process where we spent some time in Thailand and then some time in Japan. So in Thailand we went to, uh, you know, we went for field work, and in Japan we met the Filipinos that were living there, and then they came to Singapore and create created half an hour work, and it featured in our fringe festival. And then later on we started work. Uh, it's a deep belief with us uh, because of my sociology background that we need to get to know each other's realities and the artists need to immerse themselves and get educated first before we could actually begin the collaboration. Uh, if not, then it's just from the playwrights or the director's imagination. And again, it's not plural enough. Um, and the perspectives and all that we have to be dealing with. So all the playwrights present, all the different sensibilities and different viewpoints uh, came into uh, the experience of the process, but most important was this uh, tr interpreter translator now Suzuki. So she was involved. Actually, we knew her from a previous project, uh, a project with Japan with Southeast Asia, uh, which uh, Ken was involved as well. So she was. Uh, she is fantastic uh, interpreter. While you are talking halfway through a sentence and she's already translating. So here you can see she's translating the Thai woman in, uh, from Thai, uh, from, uh, she's translating from, uh, she, the Thai woman is translating into English, but the, the English is being recorded and she translates that Thai, that English to my co-director, the Japanese guy uh, sitting next to, he knows about five to 10% English. So we needed her and, um, Along the way, I realized she was also functioning as a cultural mediator. Uh, yeah, so she was more than a translator. She was actually giving a lot of cultural context and things like that, um, which was really, really very important. And then came Mobile 2, Flat Cities. And uh, this was when we realized we are less naive. So we, I kept to just one playwright and myself, one director. <laughs> Uh, because we felt that yeah, the, that's the, the, the people in power, right? But what happens with the collaborative thing is that the social relations of the creative team can be changed. So we had two translators, uh, Ken and Now, and Now is uh, stationed in, located in Japan, and uh, Ken, who has like uh, eight years in KL and nine years in Singapore, he's got the whole relationship with Japan and Southeast Asia. So he's uh, translating half or three quarters of the script in Singapore and now translates half or a quarter in Japan. And then when Harish revises the, revised the play, the script was swapped. And uh, so the translation, translator said the other half. Uh, and Ken was also the dramaturg. So co-translator as well as dramaturg to Harish and then later, he, when the process began, he was uh, the dramaturg with, my, with me uh, in the rehearsal room. Um, and there were many things to be mediated because the Japanese had more familiar with the hierarchical way of going about things. So they actually asked me to be very clear in my vision for when, before we 
create before we rehearse a scene. But I don't work that way. And they were very puzzled every time they asked me a question. I turned around to the dramaturg, to the playwright, and to the production manager because there was an assumption that uh, the, the director should have all the answers. And uh, there was one um, uh, actor who's on the, the one that's wearing brown and a young guy, and he's an actor, that act, director, actor. He was the one that was asking me to be clear in my articulation of vision. And um, he had a brilliant idea uh, for one scene. And uh, it was really, really a good idea. And uh, it was very succinct and very economical. And I included his idea in, in it. And I said that if I had a clear vision, your idea wouldn't be in. And then he understood then how we wanted to work. And so, so these were the things that needed to be mediated. And there was a, a line also that uh, I wanted to change. Uh, the father was sitting down saying the line to the, to the son at the beginning of the play. By technical rehearsal, I wanted to change that because it was an important line and I wanted the father to stand up, turn around, and say the line in a relatively more confrontational way to the son. And it, the Japanese actors broke that, uh, broke into a 15-minute discussion. And I was wondering why, because for English, you just change the tone, right? And then they said, no, uh, when, if I stand up and turn around to say this line, the phrasing of the line has to change because it wouldn't make sense because the body turns around, yeah. So, okay, at that, that day, Ken was renewing his visa, so he wasn't present. <laughs> so they, so we, uh, they called him up and we got four options of a line. And they chose one, and then Ken came the next day and said, yeah, it's the, it's the right choice. And there was one scene where uh, the Japanese character, the man is married to an uh, Indian woman living in Malaysia who's an activist. And uh, she, he tells her to be careful with her activism. And she confronts him and says, you are asking me to do so because you are afraid of your visa, right? So she's just being, uh, uh, yeah, just being naughty. But the actor that was acting, the Japanese actor that was acting, does not know what it is like to be vulnerable, hanging up, you know, hanging, uh, just not, not having confirmation of the visa, because it's Japan, Japanese living in Japan. So Ken told me he doesn't look like he understands that line. Yeah, so that, the dramaturg being present, the cultural mediator, uh, helped me realize that as well, because I also can't see, right, when the, when the Japanese is, uh, uh, saying it with understanding or not. So that, that kind of very important and pivotal uh, points in the intercultural space is where you know, uh, the dramaturg is the bridge. And uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is that this piece was also intergenerational. So they were younger Singaporeans and uh, actors and younger Japanese actors. But there was Topo, who's the one that is playing the general in the middle. Topo is married to a Malaysian living in KL, and Ken is, uh, both Ken and Dopo are about 40, and uh, so, so there was a negotiation between the older practitioners as, and the younger ones, because the younger, this one was, uh, this play, Mobile 2, was dealing with the Japanese war, um, and uh, present, past, future. Um, and the, the Japanese actors, the younger ones, don't know very much about they know the Hiroshima and the Nagasaki, but they don't know the other parts of World War II impacting in Southeast Asia. So that had to be negotiated uh, and brought across to them through Ken, the dramaturg, as well as Dopo. And then the trust bridge was built. And only then, the young Japanese actors was able to actually come on board uh, the project. But their, their ideas and their input uh, uh, it was also taken on, but it was it has to be it had to be contested and negotiated. So that's the other thing about the dramaturg. Also, they were actually in part of the process, and not only not only when the play was evolving, but even before that. My next one is Gitan Jali. I feel the Earth Move. This is a different role again. This was more interdisciplinary because we had all these we had classical Indian dance, contemporary dance, classical Indian singer sonic artist, playwright, and multimedia. So uh, we had to negotiate the disciplines, the difference of the disciplines in this work, which was touching on Tagok Tagore. And uh, this we invited Shalin Rajendran, who we informally, I call her Kawan, which was very good because it coincided with the Indonesian uh, companion. So, uh, so Kawan came on board, 
and she, as you already know, is a great asker of questions. Uh, and her questions are very good because you know when, the, as theatre makers, you have you build your convictions, right? And your whether it's your politics of theatre and the, or the aesthetics, you begin to build what you imagine and your vision, and you get deep into it. And um, and you sometimes go into the work, and you have you achieve your blind spots, and you don't know, you don't see other things, the potential of other things even. Uh, and it's very good when someone is able to see that going on, and see that uh, you are in your pet area, and then uh, what blind spots are there? You have an extra pair of eyes that, I mean, you can talk about how self-reflexive you are and all that, but if you are humble enough you know that your self-reflexivity might not reach certain areas <laughs> and you really need an outside eye because now you're dealing with different disciplines, you're dealing with different viewpoints and which part of it is experimental, which part is a new relationship you want with the audience, which part you want it to be accessible, which part you want uh, audience relationship to be challenged. So all those things are uh, what we put on the table and Shalim will look out for that uh, and the questions she brings to the table during rehearsals uh, or even after rehearsals. After rehearsals, Shalim, myself, and Harish would meet. Or, uh, yeah, and, and uh, then it's um, a different set of questions. And then there are some times where she would be asking questions of the cast members, uh, facilitating more materials, uh, more viewpoints that come up from them. So, uh, even also from disciplines, right? Because uh, different people, and also the whole thing, because like Shada here is a physical theatre actress, and. And uh, she got introduced to the how the dance people work because when the dance people work, you have to follow the choreographer's vision, mm -hmm. which for the theater physical theater actress is a shock. It's like that's an insult to my creative intelligence. <laughs> it's like you know how do I just follow the choreographer and the dancer will say no, you have to get into the mind space of the choreographer. So it's kind of you know all these difference in disciplines had to be facilitated and discussed. Um, Shalin has a full-time day job and she can't be there all the time. So there was a team of a uh, uh, dramaturgical team. Yeah. So they record notes and they are very good note takers because it's not like all the notes they record. They record very salient points that Charlene finds, uh, found helpful. Uh, and uh, these are the things that she would read so that she would keep in touch with the process quite intimately. Uh, okay, just digress about a uh, while. While we were doing all this thing, of course, uh, the whole idea of interdisciplinarity was being dramatized as well outside our work. So uh, there was a work that we revisited called Untitled Women, and uh, it's a double bill, and one of it was Untitled Cow. And I had invited Bunny Heichel, who's the sonic artist, and Shada Harrison, who's a physical theatre actress, to come to work with me on this. Um, what was, yeah, okay, I'm going to finish. So what was interesting is, uh, Bunny is a sonic artist uh, that creates his own instruments and create his own stuff. And uh, we put the text aside for Bunny and Shada to create a vocabulary. Uh, and then after we got the vocabulary, then we brought the text back in. So it was a different kind of interdisciplinary, uh, it was critique because uh, Bunny felt we weren't radical enough in our exploration of interdisciplinary practice. And now we are reworking Gitanjali into Ghostwriter and that new way of, uh, new politics of interdisciplinarity was brought, is brought into this process now. Um, and which caused a lot of problems and we got a little lost because we wanted that kind of degree of interdisciplinarity. And Charlene came in to say that, yes, we, but a visual artist collective will do an interdisciplinary project different from a theatre company. In the end, it's still a theatre company that is helming this project. So even though it's interdisciplinary, we need to respect the fact that there is the playwright and all that, and it's a theatre company that's doing it. So that helped, helped us to get out of the rut and uh, continue, and now we are put, we are we continue the process. The last one, just two minutes, uh, is Manifesto uh, where uh, Hingron and I uh, co-directed, uh, just finished, um, and this one is two directors, uh, intermedia artists, playwright, multimedia artists, and sonic artists. We don't have a dramaturg, but there was a Trevor Turking process going on 
we call it a collective dramaturgy. There was uh, Zahan, who's a multimedia artist, and Bani, who's a sonic artist, and Hingra and myself, and there was dramaturging going on. And uh, Harish comes once in a while after he wrote the text, he's not in rehearsals. So when he drops by, he has a fresh eye, although he wrote the script. So that kind of feedback uh, was not uh, in one dramaturg, but in several, dra dra uh, several people. Uh, basically, the conclusion is uh, dramaturg is uh, it, how do we dramaturg the process structure, not just the content of the work, and the environments uh, with in which with which or in which we are going to play and create. And this new uh, project we are doing with Hanchu Yue, we have redefined the social relations of the creative team after spending one week last week uh, in a workshop. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, very rich, very dense, very complex uh, knitting of the four kinds of uh, threads of works, literally their works that are coming together here. Uh, we did run a bit over, but no problem, there's a lot to, to work. So this part we wanted to have some kind of discussion going, if we could probably limit to the next 15 minutes. I'm going to take the executive decision to say that we would run a little over, mm -hmm. but I think it's fine. It's good to now have a kind of a crosstalk. Yeah, and I think the four of you have already sort of planned how this is going to happen. <coughs> All loosely spoken about it. I know, we didn't plan this part, but um, I just want to jump in and say something um, about how sometimes there is outside dramaturgy without your intending it. And this is the timing of the last general election in Singapore, which coincided almost too perfectly with it won't be too long the lesson. Because the first or second, the second weekend of it won't be too long was the weekend of the general election. And when people went to vote in the lesson, and the facilitator used the line as simple as, it really matters how you vote because it changes the way the world will be. You could feel a shudder uh, through the space. And, and sometimes that kind of coincidence uh, makes you open to the dramaturgies of the space. That, uh, and I don't just mean the physical space, but the space you are in doing things coincidentally. And it made me think about how we often forget these timelinesses that can take place without our planning them, um, whether it's chance or random or, ex or, or destiny, depending on your, your worldview, they really affect the meaning of the work and, and what can happen with it. Uh, no. Hoping on to this, um, when we created the, uh, the mobile tool, it was a time when the, uh, uh, the uh, the election came in in Japan as well, and uh, if not mistaken, and uh, and we really talked a lot about the contemporary uh, political situation in Japan in the course of our discussions, and uh, I felt this is a very very important part of the creative process because it was really a kind of an anchor, you know, or the, uh, anchoring this uh, particular production in that particular uh, social political condition. In this in this country and uh, as well as in Japan, so the uh, it that kind of discussion really, you know, answered the question why we do this production at this particular point of time at this particular country. So 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 this is one um, quite important um, process and also it's timely but yet it is a very <coughs> important part of the dramaturgy. I think. I, I just want to respond, especially the part about interaction. Because I do a lot of forum theatre, and uh, in the forum theatre, there's a role of the Joker. And I remember Augusto Boa told me one day that, no, that the role of Joker is not just to manage the interaction, but there's this word called difficultator. Uh, yeah, I, I think he invented the word. <laughs> yeah, but I think that, in a way, uh, when we are doing a forum and we're doing interactive theatre, the facilitator is actually managing the dramaturgical process actually with the audience at the same time. And that's when dramaturgy and the dramaturg is in action at that moment. 
And I think that's, that's, uh, that has provided actually a very rich, uh, fertile ground for me to learn a lot about what dramaturgy is in terms of, you know, when you want to make something make sense. Because you're trying to make sense of things. So contextual building becomes important. What is the context and how it actually has impact and effect? Uh, again, we go back to, I think, I think when uh, Yanan talked about it being dialectical. And I think that is so important in the process. Okay, then another point I want to make um, in relation to an aspect of Gitanjali, I feel, the Earth Move, is that this notion of the new migrant Indian in Singapore, of a particular location in class and space, in time and space, has become you know, one of the hot, hot issues in a way. And one of the performers, Rakha, whom you saw earlier, is somebody who has been in Singapore now for quite a few years and has become Singaporean. And so these various varied discussions about what is Indian became very interesting because there was her point of view, Abhi Shankara's point of view, Padma Sekran's point of view, uh, to a certain extent Haresh and my point of view. Um, and suddenly it became a bit of a, a, a joke sometimes. So there was Yagnia who was in the, one of the dramaturgical team because um, this notion of, okay, suddenly there's so many Indians in the room, okay? And <laughs> this does not often happen. But then what is this Indian thing that's going on? And that discussion continues now. Uh, with Ruby and Suki, who are uh, in the new, in, in Ghostwriter, because there's so much happening in the public space about what is Indian and what does Indian mean in relation to Singapore specifically, but also now more globally. This this notion is is becoming more uh, potent because of a certain economic power and a certain kind of interest in the market of India but also the marketing of India, because the origins of this project, maybe Alvin, you want to say something about that. There was an attempt to deal with Tagore and therefore offer it, you know, within a framing of an Indian space, but then it changed and things became more flexible, I would say, because of the TNS approach to kind of deconstructing it rather than reinforcing it. But nonetheless, Perceptions can vary, and that question still comes up because it's a minority space. There is still a lot of tension around depictions of Indianness that emerge, and we were just having a conversation about this earlier this morning. So you know, it kind of percolates whether you like it or not, and and what happened? Because the reference to Tagore invariably then generates a certain kind of assumption as well, which is sometimes then misleading. Uh, I, I find that, that um, yeah, we bring things into the rehearsal room and we are interacting and we are discussing these things. Uh, any issue, you know, because uh, we always confronted, people are always asking, so you think your play can transform society? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I'm, I'm not so uh, <laughs> egoistic about that. I, because what I have today is because of five books, three plays, you know, two fantastic people I've met, and it's an accumulation, yeah. So someone plants a seed, someone waters the plant, someone, you know, uh, uh, prune the shrub, and someone uh, harvests the fruit. So it's never one thing. And I find that uh, what we discover, the richness we discover when we bring these things, especially when you're doing original uh, work and it's uh, intercultural or interdisciplinary and there's other involved, uh, it's more how that will inspire a change in the social relations of the creative team and the relationship between the creative team with the production team and with the admin. Uh, increasingly, our administrators are sitting in our rehearsals uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, we wanted to make last minute change. Even when the play went on for Manifesto, uh, there was some change that we wanted to make. And the uh, stage, man stage manager said, no, it will cause a lot of havoc to the production team. And we said, okay, we will hold it back till when we restage it. So I find that that change that happens uh, among ourselves, the great, uh, the People that are collaborating, that's where the immediate change can happen. Uh, the, the, yeah, the way we work and the way we work to create the, uh, a piece of, of work. 
uh, and the stick like I think what Ingla was talking about talking to the stakeholders as well. So I find that that is very immediately powerful. Um, and whether that challenges and make a difference in the audience's perception. As I grow older, I find my value is more in the change to the immediate people that are my collaborators. I just want to quickly draw attention to two things. Uh, one is the manifesto, right? You talked about collective dramaturgy. It seems to be in a strange, not strange, but in a way happening with actually quite a few of the other productions, right? And because of the capacity of the theatre makers here, especially in dealing with device plays, the question would be, where are the nuanced differences between collective dramaturgy and the process of devising where the artists, the playwrights, are involved in shaping literally the dramaturgy of the performance. <laughs> Sorry, but just needed to... <laughs> we have an intelligent panel, so... <laughs> I don't know. I just try and respond. I think this word collective is interesting because what's happening is that it suggests uh, a group of people doing it rather than one person doing it, okay? Um, but it's not unitary. It's not collective in that sense, right? So in devising, I think, yes, a lot of dramaturgy is shared across everybody who's devising. That just happens and then you figure it out as you go along. Like yesterday, the notion of the steel, the steel rods in the concrete and so on and so forth. Or if you're in the kitchen, then what role do you play in the kitchen? Um, but I think sometimes some of the participants in the collective are more interested in the dramaturgical questions than others are. And that's okay too. Some don't really want to be bothered and you know, taken up with it. It doesn't really interest them. And you can see that in the discussion, they're like, no, need really last stop now. <laughs> <laughs> and you kind of feel, okay, fair enough. Uh, this discussion may not work for you, but it's okay too. Because then other things that they are doing may not work for somebody else. You know, they're really getting excited about this one sound <laughs> and this one movement. And others are kind of going, yeah, but what does it mean? <laughs> And so I think that openness and looseness in this notion of a collective dramaturgy is important to bear in mind. I don't think it then becomes solid. Yeah, so it's still, you know, very much open and that the would idea be... of being in the ludic space we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, very much. Um, uh, I'm reminded of when we were doing manifesto, I think at some point the actors were like, okay, enough. Uh, you're going to discuss enough, enough, enough of the talking. talking. Uh, you're going to sort it out. Uh, and then amongst the four of us, you know, uh, in the in the initial stage, I find Bunny very heavily involved. But in the last two weeks, or last three weeks, he, he then decided to just sit in his corner and work out with the sound. Bunny is just one of the performers, and but he is also a sound designer. Sound designer over there. But Zahan was the multimedia artist. It's very interesting because. During that moment, a lot of things are actually about visual compositions and things like that. So I think one thing about collaboration is that first you must acknowledge your vulnerability and what you are not good at and what you don't see. And I think uh, uh, when we were working with uh, uh, Zahan, he, he was really very good because when it was about the visual, uh, the multimedia, he will always defer to us and ask us for what we see. So in that way, it created a kind of uh, communication whereby, for example, Elvin and myself may be directing a scene. He would be sitting at the side and he would be watching and after that he would be asking questions. And those were actually dramaturgical questions. And I think it was very fluid in that process. And so similarly, when a, brief and a, a multimedia thing is happening and an actor is there, I would actually step out and want to critique about that. So I think that that kind of uh, you know, fluidness helps a lot in the process. But of course, up to some point, the decision is actually comes back to the directors and between the two of us. And in the, in the mobile too, actually, even, uh, even though I was there as a dramaturg, but actually the, uh, what I did was quite collaborate, you know, the collaborative thing with the other 
people, you know, involved in the collective dramaturgy. For example, the uh, the, the Nao Suzuki in, in, in the course of translation actually she played a really a lot of things, and she was, yeah, I, I would call her a kind of core dramaturg, you know. So uh, so even if you have a dramaturg, actually the dramaturg is not the, yeah. This is going back to the yesterday's discussion. The dramaturg is not the person in charge of do, doing dramaturgy, sure. you know. So um, so even you have a dramaturg, actually the, it's very collective. Thing that, uh, for me, you know, the, uh, the, the kind of whole dramaturgy process. I think when we are co-directing, uh, and myself, when I'm directing a scene, he's actually looking and observing, uh, and there are questions that come to his mind, and likewise the other way around, um, and uh, and then we surface the question to each other. Um, yeah, it's the same way as uh, when Zahan. I think it's just when questions are put forward. Uh, uh, even when we are having a break at the pantry, yeah, um, and uh, Bunny also had this idea. He said, "I I don't want to use sound uh, as a lubricant or use sound for transition." You see, so suddenly it's from all this working, and it because we've been working from project to project, he's discovering how we are using sound in another project, and now he holds a philosophical stand and a conceptual stand in this new project. So, uh, so even in Manifesto, when he created a, a, a device where he told the actors to speak and not say the last word of a line. And the actors need to adapt before they could improvise. And then we came up with a kind of language. And Heng Luan was interested in using that incomplete sentence as a vocabulary for the 1980s. We have, we have four eras in Manifesto. And 1980s was where there was a lot of surveillance and. Uh, things in the environment and in the arts. So he wanted to depict 1980s using that language that was created by Bani, who's a sound artist. So that device was then handed to Harish, who's the playwright. And a lot of people thought that was a device that came from the playwright. But actually, no, it came from uh, Bani, you know, and it was a decision made by Heng Wan. And then we inherited it. So that is dramaturging whilst we are creating the world, going into the creation of the world. Yeah. At this point, actually, I would like to now open it up for questions from the floor. I think we've heard quite a bit. It would be nice to hear some response or some kind of questions. Yeah. Do we have any? We have uh, one hand up there, and then Marion, and then after that, this, is that Joe? That's Joe, okay. Yes, Marion, please. Okay, hi. Um, a couple of thoughts, you know, given the fact that <clears throat> everything is so complex, meaning life as such, <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering whether we are making art making more complex than necessary or needed. Um, because whether one, whether there is a role, well, on the one hand, okay, it's, it's great that there's a new ish role in the arts so there's a new job for another person to become involved in the arts whether paid or not paid it's it's a job and it's a role and that's good because you know people get involved in thinking okay so that's the story but but whether this the dramaturg is there or not we admit that dramaturgy has been going on uh, forever ish somehow or other collective or through the lighting designer or whatever, the collaborators and so on and so forth. So so if it has been, like for example, many years ago I saw a production here in Singapore by Theatre Works directed by King Sen. I think it was Spirits Play, I'm not sure. How many I maybe in it. Anyway, I watched it and it was, it was I mean, full yeah. of movement and choreography and there was no choreographer when I looked at the program. And I said Damn, King Sen has become a choreographer. <laughs> I need to go become a director because I'm a choreographer. So, you know, I was, and, and after that, I said to King Sen, Damn you, because you now can make theatre without having a choreographer. So, what do I do, you know? Um, uh, so, you know, this like whether that, yeah, we're making things more complex than necessary. And which leads me to the actual question, which is, why now? You know how we say in, in Malaysia, and I'm sure we say in Singapore, why suddenly? Ah? Why suddenly ah, this dramaturgy thing, why suddenly? 
And nowadays sometimes we look at a work and if it's bad, we say, oh, they need a dramaturg. But actually, if the work, if the work is bad, the work is bad. La. You know, like, with a dramaturg, maybe also bad. If the work is bad, the work is bad. But we always say, oh, I wish I had got a dramaturg in. I'm like, really? The work is just bad, okay? Um, and if... You see, now I'm getting so complex. I'm trying to be simple and I'm like, no. If, if God dramaturg can, no dramaturg can, collective dramaturg can, then how? Then, like... <laughs> no, it's, it's just making uh, diverse options possible. You, I mean, I mean the, you, I'm not even ranking it. Uh, and our our uh, dramaturg came from cultural mediation. It was a nece necessity yeah, for intercultural work. Yeah. So it's organic in our process. We needed. It. It's not like we found it fashionable. <laughs> and say, hey, we want to travel festivals. We need a dramaturg. <laughs> Not true, not true. Mm. Oh, we have to be careful. We are get, taking a dramaturg not because it's fashionable, but because the world needs it. Yeah, for me, the, what was important was that actually role was still already there. You know, role was there. And I did it without calling myself doctor. So, you know, the, uh, once you give the name, of course, name is a curse. So that uh, you know, you will be cast by naming it. <laughs> you know, but but the, the the thing is, you know, that role was still there. You know, role's there, and I I did it, and I now I I I name it, doctor. Okay. Uh, quickly responding to that, why now? Um, I think it, if I look back, I can give the simple answer and say, because I'm one and I'm looking for other people. But the fact is, I do agree that there is pretty much quite a bit of organic growth and development. And yes, so now there is maybe the right time to say, what is this thing we're dealing with? What is this concept? And perhaps they are specifically assigned role for it. I'm trying not to use the word dramaturg as we already said that it was highly problematic. But the organic growth is such that it has developed from translator to cultural mediator and after a while because of the experiences that come with this translator there is then a space to develop that scope of dramaturgy uh, as for collective dramaturgy it's, it's interesting because Charlene and I come from this uh, or have an experience in this this arts collective in Malaysia called Five Arts Centre who the executive director has just posed a question, where I remember when we were doing uh, or performing uh, in certain productions, there would be these, so what we call in-house previews, where the board would come and sit and watch, and this board was as diverse, as intelligent, as creative, as talented as they are, as directors, musicians, playwrights, right? And they gave very valuable critical feedback, as scared as we were, as we were really terrified when we had these previews. But the preview was usually about two to three weeks or even sometimes a month uh, before the actual performance. It facilitated a lot of criticality and there was change and it was like your second phase to a certain degree. And I'm reminded that we now give it a name, probably, Collective Dramaturgy. Actually, when we were starting out a long time ago, there was, I think, my literature lecturer that was the one, she, he was doing drama, Max LeBlanc. So he was the one that said uh, to us, yeah, you know, uh, internal criticism or constructive, internal constructive criticism is very important when you're doing a production because you need to be as harsh as you can to yourself uh, and to the world, and your, it's a responsibility to your cast before it goes out there and the reviewers get a hand on it. So it's part of your responsibility to, uh, you know, uh, be as harsh as you can to the, to the work that you're putting out there. I think the term is tricky. Um, 
and we've talked a bit about this yesterday, I just want to point to one thing. So now both sides now is going into a new phase which is trying to work on a three-year phase and three-year proposal. We have an advisory team now. On the advisory team are doctors, social workers, range of people from the field itself. They're called an advisory team because if we ask them to come and join a dramaturgical team, they'll go, no. <laughs> but actually what they're doing and the kinds of discussions that we're having, which involve the artist and producer and now people who are engaged in the everyday nitty gritty of issues of aging, living and dying, is informing and going to inform the dramaturgy of this work hugely. And I think that is in one sense, yes, making it more informed and yes, making it more complex because it can get too simplistic. Um, but knowing how much is always going to be the challenge. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm sorry, I'll just take one more question from George. Can this hand? Yeah, right. um, thanks. Thanks for that panel. I mean, I, I, I really enjoyed the discussion. I was just wondering um, whether the panel has a conception of a crisis. Crisis. Of crisis. I mean, what might be the dramaturge's role? Uh, you know, when, when, as Ken was saying, I mean, when drowning is a real possibility, when no matter, no matter where you choose to keep your chair, the ground beneath your feet are actually unstable. So, uh, does the dramaturge actually try and catalyze a crisis? Does the dramaturge resolve a crisis, or, or? Wow. Uh, I don't have a, an example as dramatic as Ken, where I was, I fell down and I was drowned. Um, I think crisis is very much part of a creative process, like, but it a lot depends on what you decide to term and categorize as crisis. Is getting lost a crisis? For some people, yes. For me, no. Not if getting lost is part of the intent and part of the enjoyment and part of the work that is involved in making this work happen. But more seriously, I think when there is tension that is not willing to let go and move on, then I think for me the question has become how do we give this space to breathe rather than feel how do I fix it now? And thankfully I've not in, been in processes or with groups of people where the, the, the decision has to be made now. You have to give me an answer now. You have to give me a solution. But, okay, the willingness to say, let's just wait a bit, even if the bit is five minutes, and see what happens. Because crisis is useful as opportunity for things to happen. If there is a propensity and a willingness and a politic, I think, to allow for failure as well, for things to go really wrong, for things to fall apart a little bit, and to say at the end of it, okay, so that part of it really didn't work, but that's okay. Then the crisis is not going to kill you. It's when crisis is going to kill you. Uh, we created this platform called the Orange Playground, uh, where we were going to explore different uh, artists from different disciplines, uh, you know, doing interdisciplinary work. It's a kind of research and development arm. And uh, there's no production at the end of it. It's just an uh, open rehearsal. Um, and we found that it's very important because Singapore's becoming more and more product-oriented. So there's less of these spaces and there's more commercial risk putting up a production. So when we did Gitanjali and we were transitioning to uh, reworking it, uh, we felt there were so many disciplines involved and not enough time, even though we do, we do have phase one, phase two, phase three. So we brought uh, it, we brought the process into Orange Playground and so Harish the playwright worked with the set designer in one Orange Playground uh, edition and in another edition Harish worked with uh, the multimedia artist. So they were two uh, you know, uh, kind of dedicated, uh, they are about um, 10 sessions each. I, I couldn't be involved because I was away, I was bringing a, a, a play to Melbourne and uh, to Brisbane and New York. So uh, he explored with them a little bit more and now it's, gone, it's going back into the 
ghost ri uh, writer process. Um, and that came about because uh, we were addressing the crisis, uh, so to speak. But we had enough time and enough resources to see what we can do. Because when you have a crisis, there's some trauma in the process. And uh, how do we you know, address it and have a bit more time and space, as what Charlene said, to, to see how we can investigate a bit more. Because we underestimated uh, the, the, the political relationship with the disciplines involved. We just like, hey, all come together. So it's always moves from idealistic romantic uh, innocence you know into something that oh no if you want to do this actually there's actually a lot of work that needs to go into it and then as long as we address it uh, crisis is good because it brings us more makes us more aware more informed of our practice on that note i'd like to thank england alvin charlene and ken for giving us the time to share so thank you very much for, uh, for staying and I'm afraid, yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry about the running late but I think it was worth it. I, uh, I am told that we're going to start at 2 for the next session but I would like to say that we could probably start by 2.15. I'll push it back a bit. I think it should be alright and then we'll catch up because that session is a bit longer anyway, yeah? Uh, so I've been told also that I'm afraid that the audience has to clear the space so that we can do a bit of cleaning up and housekeeping. So just again uh, to, to, to remind you, the next session will be at 2.15 and then it will wrap as planned. Thank you very much. <laughs>